Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming back after the break so quick. Uh, I'm excited for this panel. So uh, as Parr mentioned, I'm Jeremy Grant. I'm Managing Director of Technology Business Strategy at Venable. Uh, we're a law firm based in D.C. with uh, what I'm told is one of the deeper privacy and cybersecurity practices in the country. Uh, this is a great panel. We're small but powerful. Um, two great perspectives from different areas of government. First, Aaron Joe, who's the Section Chief for the Cyber Division at the FBI, and then Jerry Davis, who's the CIO and Director of the IT Directorate at NASA Ames Research Center. So I was thinking about this topic over the weekend, security by design. It's something I've been passionate about for several years now. In fact, I was thinking back to a time in 2012 when I was still in government, when I was on the Metro and saw to me what is still the most outrageous ad I've ever seen. So it was from, I won't say who the company was, other than a pretty well-known government IT contractor who basically was trying to pitch to, I would assume, guys like me who were working in the government and cybersecurity at the time, talking about what they offer. And it basically had five bubbles that were going throughout the cycle of how they do things. Design, deploy, secure, manage, support. And I'm staring at it going, you got to be kidding. Can anybody tell me why? So I actually wrote the company an email and said, you guys are actually good at this stuff, because I've worked with you before, but you really need to fire your head of marketing, because this ad has made it so I don't actually ever want to buy anything from your company again, because you don't do security after you've designed and deployed. But all too often in this space, in both government and the private sector, we're still dealing with that mindset that security is something that we can somehow bolt on afterwards, that we can somehow just bring in a great team of you know, IT geeks who understand this stuff after everything else has already been designed and everything's going to be fine. And things generally don't work that way. If you need to, what you really need to do is take the time to solve problems out front rather than try to solve them uh, later on. Now the good news is it's been six years since I saw that offensive ad in the Metro and we're getting a lot better, but I don't think it's still widely understood uh, in the marketplace. And so today we're gonna have a number of discussions, a uh, number of questions for the next half hour about why this is the case, what are some good things that are happening, what aren't, and you know, what do we need to do better? So what I'd like to do first is, is start with Aaron and then Jerry, just to briefly introduce yourself and the role you play. And also if you can talk about your view on why is it that we struggle with this concept of security design and, and what are the consequences of that? So hi again, I'm Aaron Joe, I'm Section Chief in the FBI for Cyber Division. And I've been in the FBI for over 20 years um, with the last several years being focused on uh, in the cyber program. I have a unit that's focused on cyber terrorism and I have another that's focused on nation state cyber. Of course, also in the cyber division, more broadly, we have uh, criminal as well. That's not my area of expertise, but recognizing that the main trends, which are one of the things we've talked about, are things in going on right now, like ransomware and uh, business email compromise and, uh, and other things that really were not in our vocabulary only a few years ago. So I think that's what struck me over the last several years is just how quickly things have changed in America, how the landscape has changed, how crimes and nation state and terrorist behavior has changed, and what technology does to enable them to carry out their, their misdeeds and, and, and direction. And how we have to react to that and how quickly we have to change and adapt. Um, and then that means not just us as a law enforcement and intelligence community member, but also us as a nation. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, as I said earlier, I'm Jerry Davis. I'm the director of uh, information technology directorate at uh, NASA Ames Research Center out in Silicon Valley and the CIO out there. But I, I wear a, a couple of different hats uh, relative to uh, my, my role. The other role that I have is I'm responsible for uh, Security Operations Center, NASA's Global Security Operations Center, which runs out of Ames. And uh, doing some higher level work uh, with uh, NASA in the area of, of cybersecurity, particularly around uh, space systems, space systems or aeronautical systems, anything that, that flies. And uh, how does cyber impact, impact that? When we look at uh, a space system or any kind of transportation system, uh, we're largely focused on safety. All right, so safety. But I think one of the gaps and the things I'm looking at is how does cyber impact safety? That's kind of a, a new paradigm shift that we've uh, been kind of looking at over the last 
uh, several years. You go back a, a number of years, um, I wrote some papers almost 20 years ago on critical infrastructure protection, because um, I saw that uh, even then at the trend that uh, there, we're going to have a, a significant uh, number of challenges in how we secure our critical infrastructure, and we're starting to realize that more and more. So this is a, a conversation that's uh, near and dear to me, and uh, my attitude is uh, to bring together uh, collaborators uh, from around uh, different industries uh, and help try to, try to solve or, or make it a little bit better uh, as it relates to critical infrastructure and how we design security into uh, products and services at, at the onset. Thanks. So let me ask each of you, for starters, um, as we talk about security design, what are the most commonly uh, executed vectors of attack that you're seeing these days? You know, what are you hearing about from the private sector, certainly, you know, as, as people report cybercrime to the FBI? And are there ways that some simple steps with a, a security by design approach might, uh, might help to mitigate against them? Sure. So we saw earlier, I think one of the earlier speakers had a chart up that talked a lot about the different types of attacks. and depending on what your sources of information might be, that, that'll vary a little bit about what some of those attack vectors have been out there. But like I mentioned before, some of the common things we're seeing, of course, are the business email compromises, the um, ransomware attacks, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we still look at it, it's, it's users or humans in some way, shape, or form uh, that, that do something on the system that allow a, a situation to, to be present that can be taken advantage of in some way. So we, we look at that human element, and we see that in over 90% of, of the cases generally. It's, these are very general uh, numbers. I'm not giving you anything that I'm asking to be quoted or anything like that. This is just for, for the purposes of conversation here uh, and, and trying to enhance our understanding. There's a human element, and that's still what we see as being a, a primary concern, is do the users understand what it is they're allowing in, and how their security works. Because we think that a lot of people think, it, well, if the email came to me, it must be OK for me to open it. And I think that this is a very common, basic misunderstanding that we see very, very frequently. Because there's this idea that there is security by design in some way, shape, or fashion that it can't get through a firewall, it can't get through whatever it is my security uh, provides if, it, if it's if it's malware, if it's harmful, so it's okay. But if it comes to me, I can open it. So that's still a, a really common misconception and problem that we need to deal with, uh, again, across our country. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, beat up on the, uh, the, the human element side of it for a little bit more, because that's truly wh where I believe it is. That's the, the number one vector. It, it relates around people, right? And uh, uh, it's never, I've never seen a system or compromise happen because of just you know simple poor system security, but usually there's somebody or, or that did something on the end that that allowed that exploit to occur. Um, I, I'll give you a quick a quick example of why people still remain the, the, the weakest link. Um, year, years ago, right, I was a, a, a private investigator, and I used to do sub rosa investig investigation. And I used to do this thing called pretexting. Uh, today we call it social engineering. Um, but I would pretext people, and I would go up to their house. I had a uniform; it looked like looked like a UPS uniform, uh, it, it, uh, but it had a different name of a different company on it. I had a badge and that sort of thing. And if I wanted to know something about someone at the house, I could get the person. If it wasn't the the, the subject I was talking to, I can get someone to give me information about the subject by simply pretexting. So I knew that people were the weakest link. We always went to the people to get information. And that's how it works today that I still see uh, with systems is that it's a, it's a people thing. So when you're designing systems, when you're designing security in, it's not always about the technology aspects of it and how you design the technology. People are a big piece of that. And that's what we call human in the loop. What are you doing about the human that's in the loop of this technology and how are you training them and making them aware of how they should uh, interact with the system? So again, Number one, I think vector is people. Continue to be the weakest link, and I think they will be for, for in perpetuity. So let me follow up on that a little bit. There's been a theme for years, certainly coming from the cybersecurity industry, that you know, we're building these beautiful security products, but the people are just too stupid to know how to use them. It's probably taking it a half step too far, but no, there's actually been a theme. I remember an RSA session back in 2011 where somebody was on stage basically saying, if you're stupid enough to fall for, and it was insert two or three common hacks, you're just too stupid to, to be online. You shouldn't be allowed to go online. So 
remember staring at that and thinking, maybe the problem here is that we don't actually know how to build usable security. Mm -hmm. It's 2018, why is this so hard? Why is it that in order to be safe online, I can't get hardware or software that just has certain controls built in that are easy to use and that you know, make it, if not impossible, at least make it much harder uh, for an adversary to execute what seems to be one of the same four or five vectors of attack each time. So you know, one question I'd ask for you all, you know, from both of your experiences, is does poor user experience create vulnerabilities? And do we need to be thinking more about that as we're designing uh, secure IT? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the speakers earlier mentioned it too. I think he said, I want it to be so that when the user turns something on, they're not concerned about the security behind it. It's already there. And, and that's absolutely where we have to get to because you can't expect every single solitary user to be able to pr protect everything in a network system at the user level. That, that's not realistic, it can't happen. But I, I also think we need to be thinking a lot about as a country what our expectations are. Uh, you know, when we had years ago problems with fires, right, what did we do? We reacted, we said okay, now you have to ha meet fire code, you have to do fire drills, you have to give safety briefings before large events. Your fire marshal restricts the number of people who can be in a room. We, we, we reacted in a number of ways to, to reduce that. The same is true you know, for cars and when we had car crashes and people started to take note and say, I, I need a car that has safety features. You know, I don't want just brakes, right? I need one that also has seat belts and um, you know, the, the bags and, and all the kinds of things and, and safety is, is something that the consumer actually started to drive as well. So I think to your point, the consumer, it's not that, it's not that we're too stupid to use something, right? It, it's that we have to also be knowledgeable enough to ask the questions to be educated consumers, but then also those who are making the product have to, have to assume a certain level of responsibility rolling it out. It's not my job at the FBI to tell you what those things are. It's not for me to decide or impose that on you, but it's more for me to prompt that thought process and, and talk to you because of where, what we see by virtue of where we sit. You know, by virtue of where we sit, we see nation state actors doing things that we haven't seen before in this country. You know, the, the fact that some of those attacks historically, right, you look, at, you look in the past, how, do, how were we established, right? It was nation state against nation state, spy on spy. We sort of assume that risk in, in government. The, the risk that I don't think we assume that we're seeing now is nation state actors going against private industry, whether it's our financial sector, or our entertainment industry. So that tells you that there's information out there that is of value to nation states that have resources that you can't really protect against at an individual level. So that just paints a picture and we can use that picture to begin talking about a number of things that we have to change in our country. Everything from the, the security by design all the way down to why. why is, what is that human behavior we need to change? And if nothing else, the awareness that wherever I sit, I have information that is of interest and importance and value far beyond where it ever used to be in the past. Yeah, so um, when I look at uh, system security engineering, right, so it, it's a very proactive measure. And it's, but it's not new. It's been around for forever, right? This idea, this concept of around uh, designing s uh, security into systems development process, looking at something uh, at the concept definition stage and what are the different uh, security controls that you need to build in uh, very early on. Um, we've gotten away from that. We've gotten away from that in manufacturing and services and things of that nature, particularly in manufacturing. I think for a couple different reasons, right? I think number one, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. I think number two, if you're a manufacturer of, of a product, be it a, a car or an airplane or something like that, um, it's, it's very, uh, it can be very costly, right? Very costly up front. And from the business case doesn't support uh, the, the costs, then you actually, you don't see these things being designed and you don't see security being designed in from, from the very beginning. Um, and so, and then here we, we are today, right? So I remember this kind of, kind of drives me to a conference. I, I love stories, right? So uh, I'm gonna make you love my story. So I had a, I, I had a, um, uh, a dinner, this is a couple of years ago, with a, with a guy named Roger Shell. Uh, we were, the, the, the next day we were gonna go to uh, Cal Poly Pomona, and we're both doing 
co-commencement uh, addresses for this graduating classes of the cyber class. So if you don't know Roger Shell, Roger Shell was the first deputy director, I think it was 1980-81, of the uh, National Computer Security Center, uh, as they call it today, at, at NSA, right? First director. And the, the, he's called the father of the Orange Book. If you can remember the Orange Book, the Rainbow Series of computer security uh, in DOD, he was one of the, uh, the, the writers and the founders of that. He's considered a father. So I'm at, I'm at dinner with, with Roger, and we're sitting there. And uh, I said something uh, real stupid like, you know, the uh, internet just wasn't designed for security, right? I'm trying to be, you know, really smart and everything. I'm sitting in front of, you know, Dr. Shell. I said, you know, security, the internet was really just not designed for security. And, and, and the guy went high into the right on me, right? He says, you know, the internet was not designed for security because it assumed that the end nodes were already designed to be secure. And it kind of made me, made me think about that. And, and his business that he runs today is all about trusted systems and designing security in very early on. But to do that, one of the things to, to do that is that we have to understand really the threat base. And I think we don't take enough time uh, in our community, uh, whether you're a CISO yeah. or a product developer, we don't take enough time to understand the threat base to be able to determine uh, what are the, the proper security controls and how we should be building them going forward. I think the other thing that we do not do as security professionals is we don't project out. We don't look out far enough. We only look as far as where we are today. We don't really look for those kind of black swan things that take place, that are taking place today. And I think as uh, I'm talking to the CISO community here, because I was one for many years, is that we have to start thinking out, look at the threat base, looking at this potential of exploitable things, and then start looking at designing from there. We have to change our thinking and our culture going forward about how we look at threats and designing that security in at the very beginning mm -hmm. to meet the threats and the threats that are potentially out there in the future. Thanks. I wanted to ask Aaron a question, because obviously mm -hmm. your role, when bad things happen in the private sector, you're the one who gets right. the call and your team's asked to investigate. And then we were talking, you know, before the session, you know, you said, what do you commonly see? Stolen passwords, which would mean, oh, if somebody only had multi-factor authentication, you could be mm -hmm. protected. Ransomware, if I only had a proper backup somewhere that wouldn't be impacted, we protected. Okay. Um, those things are both not as easy to implement as right. everybody would like them to be. Um, so sort of a two-part question, and Jerry, I'd love your views on that as well. One, you know, those are two big ones. Are there others that are out there that are also just really logical, like, no BS, you should be implementing that and you know, given modern threat vectors. And two, what do, you, what do we need to do to make it easier for everybody to actually use? Yeah, so I, I would say the one that jumps out at me, just given your question and reacting to the question right now, is systems don't talk well or work together well. And what I, I loved the uh, Frankenstein uh, visual. I thought that the visual with the analogy was great. We've put all these things out there because the technology is great. It enables. And so people got very excited about what it can do and they wanted it. And there was a great demand and there was a great need and everybody tried to fulfill that. So what we see frequently is that there may be patches or updates or recommendations that might be pretty standard practice in an industry, but because of the way they're built and because of the way that one way was implemented over here and another it, part of the business process was implemented, implemented differently over here, those systems don't talk and they don't work together well. So the patches don't work well, the, the updates don't work well, and then you have a vulnerable system that you really didn't intend to have. And maybe initially when you rolled it out, it was secure at that time, but then over time it becomes less secure for a number of reasons and you can't keep it updated. So in some respects we look at that and say, okay, these companies, they, they purchased something up front that seemed secure. But then when they rolled it out and they put it in, in their larger environment, it became less secure and over time, things become less secure. So I think the planning, the thought process, the pr projecting out, these are the things we haven't done to the degree that, that obviously we need to do. So just that understanding of whatever's presented to you now might not fit that need over the long term now that we've seen how we get attacked and how our adversaries come at us. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of weird to me, you know, in the last probably five, eight years or so, uh, 
I've, I've heard people say the, the concept of like borders have gone away and you know, everything's mobile and you don't have any borders anymore. And, and people basically say that the concept, I've heard people say the concept of defense in depth is, is, you know, is no longer there, right? But, uh, mm -hmm. and I believe that's, that's furthest from, from the truth, right? So um, yeah, I can have uh, two-factor authentication, multi-factor, or, or whatever you call it, but when you talk about something like a ransomware or you talk about um, uh, any kind of attack on the system, those, those happen to an authenticated user, right? So, so how do you right. uh, prevent that from proceeding? You have to have, you still have to have a defense in depth methodology and architecture that you implement onto a system, right? And it, and it starts at the very outer ring. I've had this this uh, uh, this graphic that I did internal to NASA about a defense in depth strategy that starts with our governance and it, it breaks it down into the network layer and it gets down to the system layer and it gets into the application, it gets down to the data layer where you're actually trying to protect it. What are the different tools and skill sets and training and things that you have to have to make that work, so it's it's a it's a, a a through and through process. It's not dependent on any particular technology or one type of technology. Mm -hmm. I still believe that defense in depth is a, a, is alive and well, and that you have to implement with that implement your your controls with that in mind, and that also you have to also continue to always uh, have in mind that security is going to break down over time. I like to say security is biodegradable. Right? It's going to break down mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind that is to build resilient systems. How do you build a system? What are the things that you need to do that when you are no longer in a, a compromise environment, but now you're in a contested environment, how do you continue on with your mission or the, or the business that you do? So you have to build systems with resiliency in mind that they can still operate in some degraded fashion or a degraded state. Those are the things that security professionals need to think about as they're, as they're building out systems. Again, all of this happens at the very front end as you're thinking through that system design. And I think one of the things that really comes to mind when, you, when you're talking about that is just how important it is to get everyone from the leadership level of any organization all the way down because your leadership of any organization, regardless of what it is, they have a vision. Right, they, they have ideas of what it is that they want to do and what they want to accomplish and w what it is they want to get done in a certain period of time. But there has to be some discussion about can you do that securely. I don't know that anyone really thought about the fact that we would be living in a, in a day today with each hospital bed having you know, hundreds of connections and, and the security of that because it was really about patient care. Mm -hmm. And that was really important. And how do we provide better patient care? How do we provide these solutions that our country really needed? How do we give better health care and health service? How do we make it affordable? Well, by enabling certain things to happen automatically, you know, or through automation is how we accomplished one goal. But then we didn't have that larger discussion, uh, you know, about what's that security going to look like over time as these systems erode or become biodegradable. I, I think that's another good analogy. So, so really talking at those leadership levels, the vision of this country, including offering whatever it is that that business does so well securely. So you know, playing off both of those, um, you know, I wanted to tie back to some of the earlier speakers today. You know, we heard from both Tom Kemp from Centrify uh, and then Chase from Forrester just after lunch talking about the zero trust model and you know, one of the themes there that emerges to me is, as things are getting more complex in terms of the threat, simplify. Uh, you know, the, the, the Google Beyond Core story always stuck out to me because they came to this realization as they were building layer after layer after layer of perimeter-based security, and they finally came to realization, no matter what we do with a corporate intranet, it's still gonna be vulnerable. So let's turn this inside out. Let's just throw everything out there on the internet and then put four or five really strong controls in place a lot of it tied to access control, both you know, personal authentication, device authentication, fine-grained authorization, device management, uh, to make decisions in terms of who gets access to information. And recognizing that model isn't going to work for everybody and that you know, what, especially for what works for Google can't necessarily be replicated uh, in other organizations. The lesson that still stood out to me was maybe we need to take a step back and see if we've got stuff that's out there that's just adding layer upon layer that's adding complexity but not necessarily security value. And be curious to you know, get each of your take on, on that. Um, yeah, so 
if you, you know, a few years ago, uh, and I've worked at multiple agencies, you walked into our data center and you looked at our security stack, it was ridiculous, right? We had this ridiculous number of tools and technologies here just to, to secure uh, the environment. And every time you had a, a, another breach or a different time, you add another thing onto uh, the environment. There's another thing for uh, a technologist to learn or sec your security professional to learn in your environment. There's another thing for the users that they have to do. And we added these, mm -hmm. these tremendous layers of complexity um, two things, and so we have to kind of, kind of, kind of back off of that. And I think it is uh, smart to go with a couple of like really, really key foundational uh, technologies. Um, and I'm, I'm big. One of the big technologies I'm big on is, is, is how we authenticate to things. And I, I like to put a foundation under all technologies, whether they're security technology or just technology in general, like software, hardware, things like that. Is what I call provenance. Where is it coming from? Where is, if I'm talking uh, across the network and I have to authenticate to uh, a, a device and it's, it's bringing, uh, passing back credentials back to me, how do I know that I'm talking to the right device and I'm talking to the right, so it's, it's provenance. If I'm flying in an aircraft and I'm getting a control and command signal, how do I know it's the right command and control signal? So, so strong authentication, good authentication, provenance, software. What's my software pedigree? Where's my software coming from? How do I know it's good software? So I like to use an underlying theme around provenance, around everything you use in your security stack. And I like to start with um, authentication. I think authentication is a, is a key piece of technology along with good encryption technology um, going forward that I like to see in these environments. Mm -hmm. Any additional thoughts? I don't know if I have any additional thoughts. I think that I think there's a lot that we need to think about much more holistically. Just again, I go back to that, what does this picture look like? What does America need to look like? What are our expectations going forward at the consumer level, at the individual level, all the way up to the, you know, the corporate leader level, the government leadership level? Uh, and it concerns me because there's a lot of conversation around what, what can we do and whose role is it? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, the main message that I have is that everyone has a role to play. There's a role for absolutely everyone. And whether it's that individual, I'm going to make sure that I use a strong password, I use you know, multi-factor authentication, you know, I do whatever it is that I need to do to exercise those best practices all the way up to the corporate level and the whole of government level to say how are we going to execute a whole of government plan so that we not only secure our own information, but that we can somehow impose appropriate consequences on those that violate our laws, that violate those things that we hold true in America, those things that we hold as values in America. And what is it that we need to do at sort of that broader level so that we are messaging things appropriately and sharing that value system appropriately because we've talked so much about being at that cutting edge of technology, which is fabulous. There's nobody that does it better than America. You know, it's just what a great place that we're in, what a great time we're in. But we also need to think about the responsibility that comes with that and what does that look like because the adversaries, once they take something, they have it forever and they can put it out there to anyone else who will then have it forever. And they have pieces that they can build with that and getting each of our, uh, each of our industries, each of our person, just individuals to understand that, that what you have is important to hold and hold securely in some way because it gives up that, um, that American competitive advantage much more holistically when they can take and steal and do all the things that we see being done at this time and it changes our ability to be leaders in this country. So that's just thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, you know, what you got into tied into what was gonna be my, my wrap up question, which is clearly about the blinking red where we need to go. Uh, but the focus not just on technology, but people right. processes, a holistic approach to security by design. Uh, so any, any closing thoughts on that in terms of where you think we need to be moving? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we continue to, uh, you know, today, the, you know, I think the buzz term is out there is agile transformation, right? And it, it's not so much a focus on just technology, but focus on, on people and processes that you have an environment. I'm not talking about agile development, software development, but I'm talking about the having a culture that can quickly pivot as technology is, training, is, is changing. 
Um, and I think that's a, that's a, a focus that's going to continue on for you know the, the next decade or so. And my final thoughts on that are that you know after 9/11, I I saw America change in in some very amazing ways. We did things that we didn't do before. We really started looking at our legislation, what are our laws, what, what do we need to do to react responsibly so that we can protect American values and ways of life. We also came together as a people and we shared information in ways we never shared before. We reported information responsibly and we tried to respond to those things respectfully and get, it, get this country to, to really weave together and, and be that strong fabric that we need to be and I think that we need to recognize that we're at a critical juncture here. And we'd rather come together in these ways that I'm suggesting and, and ways that we all need to be suggesting and thinking about and trying to see what our role is and how we're gonna carry that out so that we can actually be much more preventative because we have an opportunity here. Things have happened, there's no question they've happened, there's no question bad things have happened and could continue to happen, but we wanna to come together and be preventative before, the, before there is something re really bad that we could have prevented had we done something by design, intentionally, holistically, and from a perspective that everybody plays a role in that. All right, well I can't think of a better way to wrap up the, this panel than uh, with that statement. So uh, I'll say Aaron and Jerry, thanks very much Absolutely. for taking the time today. And I'll